Happy Easter. I bet a lot of you have never noticed what I'm about to point out to you in the resurrection story. Mark was the first gospel written probably around the year 70. And then from there, Matthew and Luke had a copy of Mark and probably another copy of some list of sayings of Jesus and wrote their thing. And then John written much later. But the ending of Mark is totally different than the others. Mary Magdalene and the other woman go to the tomb and then it says, when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Check this out. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. That's the ending of Mark. Go check your Bibles. You'll see that there is other stuff afterward, like Jesus hanging out with his disciples, telling them that they could grab snakes and stuff. That was added later, and your Bible will say that this was added later. But it wasn't just like 10 years later, it was hundreds of years later by a group of monks who I'm willing to bet probably felt awkward about the ending of Mark. Because the other Gospels had this stuff about Jesus hanging out with everybody after he rose. But Mark just ends with, hey, he's not here, he's risen. And then the women were too afraid to tell anyone anything, and that's it. And Matthew and Luke and John have their own reasons for adding more of a resurrection narrative. And they have different intentions in Mark. And that's one of the interesting things about having four Gospels is seeing the different motivations and intentions and how they have a copy of Mark and they're actively changing it for their motivation. It's very interesting. But I like Mark's ending. And compared to the other Gospels, Mark's entire Gospel is always very straight to the point. When it comes to what we can confirm historically about Jesus, there's only a few things that most historians agree on. One, there was a Jewish guy named Jesus who did lead a group of other Jews. Two, he said something about some sort of kingdom of God, and that was a big part of his teachings. And third, he was crucified by the Roman state. And as for everything else in the Gospels, there isn't anything outside of them to confirm what they're saying historically. We can confirm that certain groups of Christians early on were saying certain things like this, but that's not confirmation that things happen exactly like that if we had a video camera to film it. And so keeping with that perspective for a moment, let's consider this. Many other people before Jesus and after Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. And what would happen usually is that person would get crucified and then the followers would go back home and decide they were wrong about who the Messiah was. And they would wait for another. Because the Messiah was supposed to take down the kingdom of Rome and reestablish the kingdom of Israel in a new liberated world. But the difference with Jesus' disciples is that it ends like all the others ended, with him being crucified, but instead of going home and deciding they were wrong about who the Messiah was, they decide they were wrong about what the Messiah was. And there's this shift where they start talking about being the body of the Messiah, which is the body of Christ. And they keep the movement going as the collective body of Christ. So that shift is historical. What made them experience that shift is up for debate and is a matter of faith. Like, was it Jesus literally coming back from the dead and walking around with them? Was that what made them shift? Or was it visions they had of Jesus or apparitions? Or was it them over years reinterpreting the teachings of Jesus? Deciding what made them make that shift is a matter of faith. But that shift we can confirm and honestly i'm just way more excited about that shift it doesn't really matter to me what made them shift because the crux of christianity is the incarnation god living and acting through us together we're the body of christ and the body of god doing the work of God through our own bodies. And so after all this, the first Christians start giving these titles to Jesus that were originally political titles. Before anyone ever said, Jesus is Lord, people said, Caesar is Lord. 
Before anybody called Jesus the savior of the world, people said Caesar is the savior of the world. Especially after Augustus Caesar won the civil war, they called him the savior of the world, bringing peace and prosperity to the world. Except the peace that Caesar achieved wasn't through actual peace. It was peace by killing the people who are in your way. And if all your enemies are dead, then I guess that's peace. But it's peace achieved through military conquest. And the Christians said, actually, Jesus is the savior of the world, achieving peace through sacrificial love. And Augustus Caesar, before Jesus is born, was called the son of God, based on a story of when Augustus was a kid at Julius Caesar's funeral and they saw a comet fly across the sky and said, oh, that's Caesar ascending to the gods. And as his successor, Augustus is the son of God. And they also considered him the son of Apollo specifically. Even the word gospel, the Greek euangelion was used by the Roman empire when soldiers would go into a town and announce Caesar's latest military conquests. And that announcement was called a euangelion. And then Mark starts his gospel with this is the good news or this is the euangelion about Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God. Unfortunately, a lot of people have made this discovery and assumed, oh, so Jesus is Caesar or the Roman Empire actually invented Jesus to keep people in line. And that's why they're given similar titles. Failing to consider that the story ends with Jesus being killed by Rome and then continuing to live despite Rome's efforts against him. So if Christianity was just Rome's attempt at keeping people pacified and conformed to the ways of the Roman Empire, it does a terrible job at that. Like if they were trying to do that, they would have written a way better story of a way more pacifist Jesus who loves and worships the Roman Empire. This isn't a copy of a euangelion. This is an alternative euangelion that's intentionally subversive by giving Jesus these titles, leaving it up to you to decide who is actually the son of God? Who is making a better world here? Caesar through military conquest or Jesus through sacrificial love? Why don't you join one of our communities where we share everything in common? Make sure the, the widows and the orphans and the foreigners are taken care of. Make sure that everyone has a place to stay. Make sure that everyone is fed. Who's making a better world here? I love how Marcus Borg puts it when he says, the message of Easter is one, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. And two, Jesus lives. He's a figure of the present, not the past. They tried to defeat him and they couldn't. So this dude in a white robe is sitting in the tomb and he tells the woman, he's not here. He's going ahead of you to Galilee. And Galilee was where Jesus's ministry started. So he tells them, go back to where this thing started. Because now, it's the disciples' turn to live this kind of life that Jesus did. The type of life that led him to his death as a historical consequence. Like we talked about in the last video. Go watch that. Good Friday. And then they ran away and were too afraid to say anything to anyone. Also, my book, The God Who Riots, Taking Back the Radical Jesus. If you're interested in this perspective, then you'll love this whole book. But it ends a lot like the Gospel of Mark. Spoiler alert, I guess. Where it's like toward the end, I talk all about Jesus' last week. And then he's on the cross. And then it just leaves off there. Jesus dies on the cross and his followers are called to respond. And it actually wasn't my intention to end the book like that. Because chapters actually got switched around as I was writing it. And that just happened to be the last chapter. But I liked that it ended like that. And I was actually a little worried that maybe some people would read this and think, Wait, what about the resurrection? You can't just end on Good Friday, you need Easter too. And I get it, but it just felt right ending the book there. And I wasn't really sure why either. And then the night before the book came out, I had an interview with Trip Fuller from the Homebrewed Christianity podcast. And he said earlier that day, someone saw he was gonna interview me about this book and they asked him what the book was about. And then he said, it's about practicing resurrection. And when he said that, it filled me with so much joy. Cause I was thinking he gets it. I may not directly refer to the resurrection after the end of the book, but the whole thing is about resurrection because it's about embodying the resurrection and living the kind of life Jesus lived. That's resurrection, which means this book is a great Easter present. <laughs>
always got to plug the book because I worked really hard on it for a long time. And I know all of you who enjoy these videos would love this book if you haven't gotten it. I know a lot of you already have too. And I really, really appreciate the support. And I'm so happy that y'all are getting a lot out of it. But go buy some for your friends too, all right? There's an audio book too. Go get that. And give the book to your friend and be like, this book's about resurrection. <laughs> Thank you for watching. You can also support me on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Damon Garcia. And I hope you have a good day. I'll see you later. Thank mm -hmm. you.